to this, the first official event of our centennial week, I bid each and every one of you a most cordial welcome. The trumpets have called us to attention, but evidently they didn't reach far enough to find the organist designated, so we'll skip the prelude and uh, go right to the hymn that is printed in your folders. Have you all the centennial booklets uh, so that you can follow the program and uh, join in the, in the singing? And the familiar hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. And uh, we do have an organist for the playing of the hymn. I hope that she has the volume up sufficiently so that we can hear it in this end of the room. Uh, let's stand and sing the four stanzas of the hymn as printed on your program. I'm standing for the invocation by Dr. Norman Bakken, Professor of Biblical Theology at Northwestern Theological Seminary and formerly Chairman of the Alumni Board at Augsburg College. Dr. Bakken. May our gathering here recall us with incentive to the environment and learning which made the city of Augsburg great, a place where poets and politicians, painters and diplomats, historians and artisans, men of letters and scientists might together gather and promote the culture and the matters which pertain to truth. In order that philosophy and life, religion and learning might interact for good, both here and in the world. In the spirit of Augsburg, may the concern of faith be the occupation of layman and cleric alike. May this center, like the city whose name it bears, open vistas of communication between various types and conditions of men, that freedom may flourish, justice may abound, and love create sons and daughters of a humanity reborn in the dignity and honor, learning from the past and open to the future. This occasion is in many ways the fulfillment of several dreams. In the first place, we had dreamed of bringing together during this centennial week many of the people who had been associated with Augsburg College as instructors, teachers, professors down through the years. And I want to say that I am extremely pleased and happy to be able to welcome many former faculty members to this gathering this afternoon, including two former presidents, President Christensen and President Harbo. To all of you, we are glad, we say we are glad that you came back for this occasion to be a part of our centennial festivities and possibly to see some of the changes that have taken place at the Augsburg where you once worked. Another dream, of course, is fulfilled today in the completion of this building. Now this is the third year that the Augsburg College Center has been in operation, but this is the first time when we can say in all honesty the building is completed because there was one room left unfinished when we dedicated two years ago, a room that is now finished, a room that we had high hopes for because we thought it could be not only a fine gathering place for special occasions here at Augsburg, but also it could be a place to commemorate the meaning of this institution's name. It was a hundred years ago that August Venus, whose two daughters are here today, by the way, visitors from Norway, took this little band of scholars from Paxton, Illinois, up to Marshall, Wisconsin, and began the school called Augsburg, giving it that name because he wanted 
to be sure to indicate to the constituency that the institution was faithful to the Confessio Augustana, which was the Latin form of the Augsburg Confession's name, but in order to avoid confusion, took the Germanic form Augsburg. And because there are so many interesting things in Western history, both sociologically, culturally, and religiously, in Augsburg, Germany, we thought that the third room named after a city should bear the name of the city of Augsburg. We have a Marshall Room, which is the faculty lounge. We have a Minneapolis Room, which is another private dining room. And we have also the city of Augsburg Room. And I'm going to call upon Mr. Burton Fossey, Vice President and Assistant to the President, to give you just a little bit of a story about how this room emerged and what has gone into it. And I think after you have heard from him, you'll have a little better idea of the significance of the City of Augsburg Room here in the College Center. Mr. Fossey. Well, I was asked to talk about the story of the city of Augsburg room. And I think the story goes back uh, perhaps three or four years. Uh, as is the custom, I think, in uh, college people planning facilities, uh, a group of people go out and visit and see how others have done it. And I recall very uh, vividly the trip that uh, Dr. Philip Quanbeck, myself, and Dr. Peter Armacost, our former dean of students, took uh, one winter day, I think about four years ago, where we visited a number of college center buildings in the Midwestern part of the country. And as we made this visit, it became very apparent to us that there were two approaches to the development of a college facility. One approach, and the more common approach, was that of a logistical approach. Spaces for feeding, spaces for meeting, spaces for uh, lounging, and so on. Uh, spaces which were innocuous. But here and there, we found where people had paid some attention, drawn on something that had meaning for that institution or that place, that these places, that these spaces, seemed to come alive, to have some uh, warmth to them, and so on. And we adopted, or tried to adopt, this approach in our planning of the facilities here at, at uh, Augsburg College, and particularly here in the College Center. And as Dr. Anderson has referred, somewhere along the line, uh, the idea came up, I think it was yours, that let's name the dining meeting rooms, the special dining meeting rooms, after those cities that have been important in, the, uh, in one respect or another to the life of the college. He's referred to the Marshall Room, the Minneapolis Room, and now the City of Augsburg Room. City of Augsburg Room has, has been alluded to, has significance in that our name is derived from the, the name of the Augsburg Confession, which in turn received its name from the place of its reading the city of Augsburg, Germany, this basic creedal document of the Lutheran Church. The city is a fascinating city otherwise and has significance for a liberal arts college because in this city founded by uh, Caesar Augustus spans the whole panorama of Western civilization as we know it from Roman times to the contemporary times uh, of today. The medieval, the Renaissance, the expression of the Baroque, the Rococo, in terms of art, and the, the poets, the sculptures, the scientists that uh, Dr. Bakken referred to in his uh, invocation. So it has uh, uh, many, uh, lots of significance, and it was a, uh, a very interesting theme to develop the environment or decor of this room because, in a sense, that's what we were doing. The story uh, of the city of Augsburg room is also a story of people. 
Uh, usually that's always what happens. And I'd like to tell you about a few of these people and a few of the things that you will uh, uh, look at in this room. One of the people uh, was Dr. Einar Johnson of our Department of Education. He attended the World Council of Churches meeting in Uppsala, Sweden uh, in 1968. And uh, at this meeting, the Franz Meyer firm, a stained glass firm of the city of Munich, Germany, had an exhibit at this firm. And out of the, the uh, uh, interest that Dr. Johnson had in the city of Augsburg room, a correspondence to, uh, developed between uh, the Franz Meyer room and the President Anderson. And out of this, uh, we will be receiving, it got fouled up in the, in the um, Bureau of Customs and all of this, we'll be receiving a copy of the Romanesque window, the Prophet Daniel, a copy of a window uh, which was made during the restoration of these windows in the city of Augsburg after World War II. They are the oldest extant windows, or stained glass windows uh, in the world. These, uh, this is then one of the exhibits that will be in this room. It unfortunately is not there now but it came about through uh, the interest of one of our faculty members. Uh, several years ago, the Augsburg Choir toured the city of Europe. And the custom of accommodating the members of the choir is the same in Europe as it is here in the United States. The members of the congregation, St. Anna Congregation, where the choir sang its concert, uh, housed Augsburg students. And one of our students, uh, Steve Christensen, was housed in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Gerhard Linder. Subsequent to that time, Steve's brother, uh, in the service, spent a couple of years uh, in the service and was stationed for a while at Augsburg and developed an acquaintance with the Linder family established by his brother on the choir trip. This uh, Frau Linder, Linda Linder is an amazing and interesting person. And uh, she has been responsible working with the City Library of Augsburg and with the Roman Museum for enabling us to uh, exhibit reproductions of some of the uh, Roman artifacts that have been uh, uh, discovered through excavations recently. She has been responsible for sending us microfilms of of pictures of the uh, Augsburg Confession, the documents which we have reproduced and are displaying in the room. On the right as you enter the room is one of these uh, stones, reproduction of a stone, a marking stone, a conscription to the, the god uh, Mercurius Augustus, god of trade, travel, uh, merchants, and strangely enough, thieves. I don't know how the thieves got related with merchants and trade and travel. Uh, also displayed in the room is a, a reproduction of a scarophagus cover, the funeral face dating from about the third century. Uh, another party I'd like to mention, one of our alumni got interested in this room, Mr. Lauren Erickson, uh, who traveling in Europe a couple of years ago, uh, spent some time in Augsburg, and we were looking for the appropriate furnishings for this room. And during the January market a year ago, Lauren and I spent two days wandering through the merchandise mart until we found the furniture that felt right. Uh, Mr. Erickson introduced us to Fritz Weiss, a third generation blacksmith in the little town of Canaranzi in the southwestern part of the state. It's a bank, a general store, a blacksmith shop, and an elevator. The banker told us, counting stray cats and dogs, you couldn't number Canaranzi at 100. But Fritz Weiss reproduced for us a recall of the gates of the St. Anna Church, the monastery uh, and very old school in the city of Augsburg. Uh, in 1943, uh, under the direction of Randolph Haugen, the the um, Augsburg Publishing Company published a volume called The Life of Luther. 
as a part of this publication, he had collected the Wappen, or the, the coats of arms of the signers of the Augsburg Confession. And one day last summer, his secretary found and dug out from storage a set of the, the coats of arms of the, of the uh, signers of the Augsburg Confession. These have been framed and are part of the grouping and the display within the room. Our own staff have contributed. Your program notes uh, indicate the John Mosen, one of our uh, faculty members in the art department, has done a woodcut, a contemporary impressionistic uh, expression of the city of Augsburg. This is framed and is part of the decor of the room. And as recently as 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, Terry Saturn, a student, uh, finished Augsburg just two years ago, sent a sculptural piece from the room, a uh, iron sculpture uh, of Martin Luther, Here I Stand. Well, it's been uh, extremely interesting to do this kind of room. Most of what you see there has been chosen for its significance and its relationship uh, to the city of Augsburg. I would like at this point also to express appreciation to other people, the people that execute. To Bob Sutphin from West Bergen and Klaus, an interior designer firm here in Minneapolis. To Joe Hartnett of Sverdrup and Parcel, architects and engineers in St. Louis. And to Glenn Olson, the uh, superintendent of this job from our general contractor, Gunnar I. Johnson Company. I think that in very brief, Dr. Anderson, is part of the story in the city of Augsburg. Thank you, Mr. Fossey. And I think from that you can gather that not only has a great deal been done in order to make this room possible, but uh, still more will be done. And he mentioned the stained glass window, which reproduces one of the oldest windows in the world, and other pieces which we hope will be a part of a growing collection of memorabilia, of library volumes, and of other artifacts which will recall the significance of the city of Augsburg. When we thought about this occasion, we wanted someone who would be able to give us a glimpse as to the contemporary significance of a document which may, to many people, be an unknown document, namely the Augsburg Confession. A few years ago, when the choir did go to Europe, and they were sponsored in Norway by Normans Forbundet, the question came back, why does this college carry a German name? This evidently was of some concern to the people in Norway. And when it was explained that the college stood for the, or had its name from the Augsburg Confession, there were no more questions asked because the people of Norway have had sufficient exposure to the history of the Lutheran Church so they know the meaning of this confession and its significance to uh, the Lutheran Church. But when we wanted to find someone who could tell us from a contemporary point of view something about this confession or one particular part of it, there was no better person to do this than Dr. George Farrell of the University uh, of Iowa. Uh, he teaches in the School of Religion at the University of Iowa and is also a director of this very interesting institution which has carried on in a pioneering fashion a new relationship to a university setting uh, for uh, religion and the church. Uh, one of his most recent volumes, and he has written many, I personally count uh, his book The Ethics of Decision uh, and uh, uh, Faith or Love Beyond Faith, Faith Active in Love, that's right, the one on Luther. Uh, as two of the finest volumes on the subject of ethics that I have read. But this last one that he wrote on uh, the Augsburg Confession, a contemporary commentary, uh, brings to the surface uh, the relevance of this particular document to issues that we are struggling with today. And therefore, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. George W. Farrell, who will speak on Augustana 16, uh, The Courage to Change. Dr. Farrell.
Thank you, President Anderson, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Since it is not likely or even desirable that all of us would know the 16th article of the Augsburg Confession by heart, it seems appropriate that we begin our discussion of this subject by telling you what it says. We shall use the English translation of the Latin version as published in the Taput edition of the Book of Concord in 1959. Our article, Article 16, reads as follows. Our churches teach that lawful civil ordinances are good works of God and that it is right for Christians to hold civil office, to sit as judges, to decide matters by the imperial and other existing laws, to award just punishments, to engage in just wars, to serve as soldiers, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to swear oaths when required by magistrates, to marry, to be given in marriage. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who forbid Christians to engage in these civil functions. They also condemn those who place the perfection of the gospel not in the fear of God and in faith, but in forsaking civil duties. <coughs> The gospel teaches an eternal righteousness of the heart, but it does not destroy the state or the family. On the contrary, it especially requires their preservation as ordinances of God and the exercise of love in these ordinances. Therefore, Christians are necessarily bound to obey their magistrates and laws, except when commanded to sin, for then they ought to obey God rather than men. End of quotation. In the 16th century, this article caused little excitement. To those who read it then, it seemed to rehearse the conventional wisdom of the time. It made the safe remarks against alleged anarchy of the Anabaptists and supported the government obedient and obedience to existing laws. Indeed, nothing in this article seemed very radical to the contemporaries. What then was its significance? If we try to understand the importance of the 16th article of the Augsburg Confession for the Reformation in the 16th century, we would have to say that it furnished the political basis for the Reformation. The distinction between Christ's kingdom and the political kingdoms opened up the space and produced the elbow room for the reformation of the church. By saying yes to the legitimate political ordinances of the nations in which they lived, the advocates of re reform escaped the two-front war against the ecclesiastical and the political power structure which aborted the reform efforts of the Anabaptists. When Melanchthon wrote in the Apology, quote, the gospel does not introduce any new laws about the civil estate, but commands us to obey the existing laws, whether they were formulated by heathen or by others, and in this obedience to practice love, he assured the power basis for the Reformation. Without the support of at least, or at least the benevolent neutrality of some of the bearers of political power, religious reformation 
would not have been possible in the 16th century. Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession, including the caricature of the Anabaptist position, was the price that had to be paid, and it would be my claim that the evidence indicates that it was paid willingly and honestly. Luther and Melanchthon believed all these statements about government, they even believed that all Anabaptists were either open or hidden Münzerites. And after their personal encounter with the anarchy of the peasant war, they welcomed the support of the political powers. They were increasingly willing, as the years moved on, to have the assistance of the political power structure in the task of reformation. Because of their experience with the demonic pretensions of ecclesiastical power, they were less able to see the equally demonic potential in the pretensions of political power. It would now be possible to show how this attitude expressed in Article 16 affected the political and social development in Europe and America up to the present. It led first to a too easy acceptance of the famous formula, cuius regio, eius religio, who's the rule, his the religion, which brought so many people to America. It led also to the wars of religion and the resulting disenchantment with all absolute religious claims. It contributed not insignificantly to the, universe, to the uncritical acceptance of the authority and wisdom of the state and of those who rule, which has borne its bitter fruit in our time. But these observations are essentially historical, and the Augsburg Confession is also a theological document. It is the most universally accepted confessional document of the Lutheran churches of the world. What then is the theological significance of Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession in our time? In order to answer this question, it is essential to make a distinction between the doctrinal form and the doctrinal intention of the Augsburg Confession. The form is bound to the 16th century, dealing with imperial laws and the powers of magistrates, while we live under the United States Constitution and accept the power of the people to make their own laws. But the doctrinal intention is quite different. First of all, it insists that God the Creator is a living God and that his creation continues. Lawful civil ordinances are good works of God. We note that not only the ordinances of the past, but quite specifically those of the present are considered good works of God. The commitment of the Augsburg Confession is not to a static political order either of the first century or of the 16th, but rather to the living creator God who establishes order for the sake of man. The Augsburg Confession supports the structure that has evol evolved in the 16th century as functional for its time. Matters would be decided by the imperial and other existing laws. It does not advocate a return to the Mosaic law or a legalistic interpretation of the New Testament as furnishing a law binding for all times. By resisting all efforts on the part of certain elements of the Reformation movement, to return to the alleged purity of the life of the first century church or the Deuteronomic Code, the Augsburg Confession makes it in turn impossible to attribute eternal validity to the social order of the 16th, 19th, 
or 20th century. From the fact that Article 16 allows the princes and citizens of the 16th century state to participate in war and to administer the death penalty, it cannot be concluded that this is necessarily an appropriate exercise of power for the state in our time. Article 16 is a commitment to change as well as order. It rejects any form of restoration or repristination. Its commitment to order is not a commitment to any particular order. The criterion for the kind of order envisioned and advocated is spelled out. The gospel, it says, does not destroy the state or the family. On the contrary, it especially requires their preservation as ordinances of God and the exercise of love in these ordinances. Love furnishes the standard for the evaluation of a particular kind of order. According to the Augsburg Confession, we must ask, is it possible to exercise love in, a particular in the particular structures of our time? Summarized here under the heading, Politia and Economia, Politics and the econ Economic Realm. Now, let us try to be specific. A system which depends for its survival on the existence of a foreign enemy who must be hated and turned into a diabolic power in order to keep the political system operative may no longer meet the specifications of ordinatio in the sense of Article 16. Can a political system which is able to raise practically unlimited amounts of money for war and destruction, but, it, but is incapable of feeding the hungry in its own midst, be described as ordinance of God? in the light of the love standard of Article 16. Such questions are not merely legitimate, they are imperative. The Augsburg Confession stress upon the importance of the ordinances in which love can be operative demands a constant re-examination of all existing ordinances. It raises questions not only in regard to international and domestic politics, but in regard to the relation of the races, the economic order, the educational and religious institutions of our time, and even the way we have institutionalized the relation of the sexes and the generations. The Augsburg Confession does not supply answers to any of these questions, but rather it justifies their constant re-examination by assuming the need for change in the political and social life of man, the stress upon the imperial and other existing laws. It shifts the emphasis to concern for the kind of change which may be desirable. To those who see in the Augsburg Confession an authoritative statement of the faith of the Christian Church at a particular time in history, it does not give answers to the specific questions which happen to confront them, but rather helps them to state these questions properly. The right questions about the civil ordinances is not are they the same as those of the Old and New Testament? Or are they valid because they are ancient or because they are modern? The right question is rather how politia, the entire public realm, 
and economia, the entire private realm, the larger family, in all its intricate relationships of support and control, can be preserved as orders of God and in such a way that men can show their faith active in love within these orders. The Augsburg Confession tries to free the discussion of the kind of political and social order in which Christians may participate, participate from concern with its legal, historical, or biblical origins or the religion, political ideology, personal morality, or the, of, or the age of those who happen to administer them for the question, do these ordinances still fulfill the task for which they were designed? Do they support man in his effort to be truly human? Again, to be quite specific, and using the political language of the day, the way in which the Oxford Confession poses the political and social questions casts serious doubts on our contemporary political rhetoric. The emotional invocation of the vague term establishment by some of the young agitators is about as useful as the emotional use of the term socialism or communism by some of the old agitators. Indeed, the present preoccupation with the rule of the young, the, pervas the pervasive political Lolita complex, is about as sensible as the deplorable seniority system in the United States Congress. Decisions that are made on the basis of ideological irrelevancies obscure the pragmatic and functional criteria which should guide us in our action in politia and economia, namely the concern with the earthly welfare of man. That this concern with the earthly welfare of man is a valid Christian concern is a second major contribution of Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who forbid Christians to engage in this, these civil functions. It says, we must state first of all that the factual judgment concerning the Anabaptists here expressed is simply false. But even if the reference to the Anabaptists was a shibboleth necessary within the political context of Augsburg in 1530, there is another side to this sentence which still deserves our attention. Christians are supposed to engage in these civil functions, it says. The reverse of the condemnation of non-participation is the command to participate. The Augsburg Confession calls Christians to responsible participation in the affairs of this world. To be specific, to hold civil office, to sit as judges, to decide matters by the imperial and other existing laws, to award just punishments, to engage in just wars, to serve as soldiers, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to swear oaths when required by magistrates, to marry, to be given in marriage. In short, Article 16 is a call to total participation in social and political affairs. The details of this participation which are listed are to serve as illustration. They are not supposed to be exhaustive as the etc. in the German version indicates. And as we said earlier, they describe participation in the worldly affairs of the 16th century. Taken seriously, Article 16 demands total participation in the life of every century. And for us, total participation in the human affairs of the last third of the 20th century. It is noteworthy how positively the Augsburg Confession describes this involvement. It speaks of exercising authority rather than obeying the authorities, about holding office 
not merely obe obedience to office holders, about sitting as judges, not merely accepting judgment, about deciding matters, not merely submitting to decision. There is a profound difference in mood between the position of the Christian citizen in the 16th century and the position of this citizen in the time of St. Paul. The difference between Romans 13 and Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession is dramatic. Paul writes to the Roman Christians in the first century, every person must submit to the supreme authorities, Romans 13.1. It is written for men and signed by men who have great, the Augsburg Confession is written for men and signed by men who have great political and social responsibility. It recognizes the changes that have taken place in the intervening 15 centuries. Similarly, we must recognize the changes that have taken place in the 440 years since Augsburg. Changes that are even greater than those which account for the different mood of the Augsburg Confession. Faithful to Romans 13 and Augustana 16, we must define our responsibility for the future of our world. We may not, to use the vernacular, we may not cop out. We must take our full responsibility in the political and social life of our time and make the civil government a more effective instrument of God's creative goodness. Civil office must not only be accepted, but reformed. Sitting as judges does not suffice. The laws by which we judge must be rewritten in order to serve the welfare of all men. The whole question of war has to be thoroughly re-examined. It may no longer be possible to engage in just wars and to serve as soldiers in national armies. The flash over Hiroshima in 1945 may have made the notion of the just war obsolete. The notion of private property deserves thorough study. With the advent of private properties like General Motors or Standard Oil of New Jersey, the entire notion of property as used by the Augsburg Confession may have become an anachronism even to marry and to be given in marriage may need a new understanding in the light of the evolving equality of the sexes. Of course, there are also inescapable questions that didn't even occur to the writers of the Augsburg Confession. The racism which permeates our entire life as a nation and adds a tragic dimension to every one of the above problems was simply unknown to 16th century Germans. Yet it is an issue that has to be faced honestly if we want to take Article 16 seriously. And the same interest in the earthly welfare of all human beings, black, white, brown, and yellow, must be our overriding concern rather than the defense of white or black ideologies spawned by hate and resentment. Other issues of great importance may not even have been recognized or defined by us. Article 16 is completely open-ended. The etc. is all-inclusive. Wherever issues may still appear, Christians are called to responsible participation. And finally, Article 16 warns against perfectionism as a threat to responsible participation in the affairs of this world. It condemns those who, quote, place the perfection of the gospel not in the fear of God and in faith, 
but in forsaking civil duties. The gospel teaches an eternal righteousness, they continue, an eternal righteousness of the heart, but it does not destroy the state or the family. On the contrary, it especially requires their preservation as ordinances of God and the exercise of love in those ordinances. Perfection comes to man from God. It is a gift which he accepts in faith. It is indeed an alien perfection which God attributes to man for Christ's sake. If men forget this, the Oxford Confession asserts, then he will seek perfection in the way in which he handles the affairs of this world. And if he tries this, he will become aware of the impossibility of being meaningfully involved in human affairs without being involved in ambiguity and evil. Thus, in order to achieve perfection, it, he will of necessity try to escape civil duties. Consistent with its basic theological emphasis on the centrality of justification by grace through faith, the Oxford Confession spells out the implications of this faith for the political and social life of man. Those who see perfection not as a gift of God's grace, but as a fruit of their own ethical effort, have two options. They can either trivialize the moral decisions which confront men and thus achieve a perfection which is of necessity both insignificant and irrelevant, or taking the complexity of the human predicament seriously, try to reduce their involvement in order to minimize their temptations and the occasions for false and evil decisions. Both alternatives have been tried. The history of Christian ethics records the efforts to reach perfection by detailed prescriptions regarding food, sex, speech, housing, clothing, and entertainment. It was not too long ago that people seriously debated distinctions between bridge and rook, coffee and beer, trousers and skirts as morally significant. By setting one's sight sufficiently low, it is possible to live a life of moral perfection. But in order to do so, morality has to be defined in essentially immoral terms. Those who are more sensitive to the complexity and profundity of moral issues and still seek to achieve perfection, do so by withdrawing from all those areas of life where the ambiguity of all human choice is most apparent. In the language of the Oxford Confession, they will refuse to hold civil office, to sit as judges, to decide matters by the imperial and other existing laws, etc. While this too is escapism, it is on a much higher level because of its awareness of the real issues. It does not trivialize the issues, but taking them seriously, it tries to evade them by withdrawal from the world. In the light of the Oxford Confession, both options are egocentric betrayals of love. The task of the Christian is not the protection of his own moral perfection, but the service of God in the world and in the person of the neighbor. By accepting the eternal righteousness of the heart as a gift of God, man is freed from the alienating and destructive self-concern for responsible life on behalf of his fellow man. There is one final observation in Article 16 which deserves our careful attention in 1969. Nothing in this call to responsible participation in the life of the world is to be construed as a heteronymous command from the church 
or the state to be obeyed by an unwilling subject. Indeed, if any of this seems to you to force you to go against your conscience, in other words, if you think that these commands force you to act in a manner which is counter to God's will for you, you must refuse to obey, for one must obey God rather than men. Ultimately, nobody else can make this judgment for you. You may listen to political, psychological, and religious experts, but the final decision must remain yours. At this point, the Oxford Confession stands firmly behind the man who in 1530 was not allowed to be at Augsburg to plead his cause. The man who had been excommunicated by the official church and condemned by the emperor because nine years earlier he had said at another diet of the empire, since then your serene majesty and your lordships seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. 300, 450 years later, this is still true. May God help us to be obedient to our conscience in the great conflicts of our time. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farrell, for so clearly stating the fact that the name which this institution bears represents a document that is not an anachronism. Thank you for being with us today. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing the two stanzas of A Mighty Fortress is Our God, after which the Reverend David Preuss, the Vice President of the American Lutheran Church and a member of our Board of Regents, uh, will perform the rite of dedication. After we have sung these two stanzas, will you stand, and then Dr. Price. Will you remain standing for the act of dedication? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. From the 24th Psalm, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it, established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, 
and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us pray. O Lord Most High, we give thee thanks for all thy saints, martyrs, and confessors, for all thy faithful servants who in their lives have witnessed a good confession, and for all dear to us whom thou hast taken to thy nearer presence. Grant us grace to follow them as they followed Christ, and bring us with them to those things which eye hath not seen nor ear heard, which thou hast prepared for them that love thee, through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who hast given us a history, bless to the students, faculty, and staff of this college the events of the city of, that the city of Augsburg Room commemorates. Grant that the city of Augsburg Room may be a reminder to us of the greatness thou hast raised up and that thou dost yet seek from thy people. Bless this room, this building, this college, thy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed and dedicate be the city of Augsburg room. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We have told you a little bit about the history of the city of Augsburg Room, but we haven't told you the whole story. And I'd like to fill you in a little bit at this point. This lovely building, together with the residence tower on the freeway, were designed and engineered by the firm of Sredrup and Parcel and Associates of St. Louis. The head of that firm is an illustrious graduate of this institution, General Leif J. Sredrup. As uh, all good uh, architects and engineers do, uh, he came up here one day to look over the, uh, the job and see how it was going. And uh, when uh, a man as important as General Sredrup comes around, he gets the full tour from the president. And uh, so I took him through the building as it was under construction. And we came to this spot where the city of Augsburg room is now located, and I said, this room is not going to be finished. I said, we have some special plans for it, but we don't have any money for it. We'd like to make it the city of Augsburg room. Well, he didn't say anything, but we happened to be at a luncheon that noon, and he got up and he said, I'd like to give the first gift of $10,000 to the city of Augsburg room. And so it was his significant gift that began uh, this project. At the same time, we had given a proposal to the Lutheran Brotherhood Insurance Society asking them if they would care to support uh, such a shrine, so to speak, to an important aspect of the Lutheran Reformation because they have done so much of this sort of thing, been interested in preserving the Lutheran heritage and making real to this generation some of the things that come to us out of that heritage. In fact, you will find in the room today a very excellent collection of Reformation coins and medallions furnished us by uh, the uh, Lutheran Brotherhood. But uh, about two years ago, at, or a year ago, at Omaha, at the convention of the American Lutheran Church, it was announced uh, that the Lutheran Brotherhood Insurance Society would give to Augsburg College $25,000 for the purpose of completing the city of Augsburg room. And so we have these two uh, firms and these two people to thank today, General Sverdrup and Mr. A. Herbert Nelson, the president of Lutheran Brotherhood. And I'm going to call upon both of these gentlemen uh, to come to the platform and bring a brief greeting. But before they do, I want to say again how much the college and all of us appreciate what they have done to make this dream a reality for us here at Augsburg. First of all, General Sverdrup and then Mr. Herbert Nelson. President Anderson, distinguished guests, but particularly 
friends of my youth. It is now over 50 years ago since I left Augsburg. I'm glad to say that my philosophy as of then is still my philosophy. There's a great difference in Augsburg as it was at that time and as it is now. And I wouldn't have it return to what it was. I mean the physical aspects. It was rather a Spartan life and rooms that most of us lived in. There were more cubby holes and rooms. The furniture was second hand that we inherited or bought very cheaply from our predecessors. And the facilities as a whole were primitive. But we were here for one purpose, to buy an education. Most of us worked our way through and worked hard, and we bought an education. And for somehow, for some reason or another, we seemed to be more concerned with our responsibility than with our rights. I still believe in those days. Not that it can't go hand in hand, but responsibility goes along with any authority, any power. It goes along with life itself. It's a little longer than I intended to go, but I was a little moved. The thing that I'm particularly happy about is to see the development here. As an engineer, I know that you either go forward, you either progress, or you slide back into oblivion. And to see the development here fills me with happiness. Not that it's grown so much in size, that's fine, but the facilities, the teaching departments, all of it I'm proud of. And I'm proud to have a small part in this development, just as sure as I'm all of you are. It's a wonderful school, lived through the years, and it's going to go on and on and become better and better. Thank you. Dr. Anderson, he nodded to me, and that was my introduction. I'm very, very happy to be here today and to extend greetings to this group, especially on behalf of Lutheran Brotherhood. I had the pleasure last summer of having dinner with Dr. and Mrs. Anderson and also the Linder family that you have heard about today. And I could uh, see then that this Augsburg room was going to be terrific. Mrs. Linder is an expert on uh, art and culture, and, and uh, they live in the city of Augsburg. And when I found out she was going to help out with this room, I felt confident that Lutheran Brotherhood hadn't misplaced its confidence at all. And I am doubly uh, sure today that uh, what little we have done for this room is going to be very beneficial to Augsburg College, city of Minneapolis, when this portion of the culture from Augsburg is transferred here to this city and to this college and to the Augsburg room in particular. So we are so pleased, uh, Dr. Anderson, that we could participate, and I'm very happy to have the privilege today of extending greetings to you. Thank you very much. Herb, I hope I made it clear that you're the president of Lutheran Brotherhood, and I'm going to make it even clearer that your very fine hospitality uh, in connection with Mr. and Mrs. Linder and their two children that took place on his lovely yacht uh, down on the Mississippi, and we went up to St. Croix and had a great afternoon and evening. And uh, I should say about Mrs. Linder that she has translated into English a little book entitled A Small Book About a Great City. And it's a series of vignettes about Augsburg. It's 
starting with Caesar Augustus, on down through the uh, Roman period, the medieval period, the Reformation period. Did you know that this is the 450th anniversary of the Fugari, which is a little settlement in the middle of Augsburg, the oldest social settlement in the world, and it is still in operation? And the Deutschmark 75 a year, which was the original charge, is still charged per year for rental today, providing those who live there will say a daily prayer for the founder. <laughs> but this is a part of this interesting heritage. This is the city from which the Mozarts came, the Holbeins came. Uh, this is the city uh, of the diesel engine. This is the city of uh, Bertolt Brecht. Many, many interesting things. And so we're so grateful to Lutheran Brotherhood and Mr. Nelson, to Sverdrup Parcel and Associates and General Sverdrup for making this possible. And I want, uh, just at this point, because it gives me an opportunity also to make a commercial, uh, to present to uh, Mr. Nelson and to General Sverdrup uh, copies of the new history of Augsburg College, which just came off the press this week. The book entitled From Fjord to Freeway, written by Dr. Carl Chrislock, the head of our history department. I think a most interesting and valuable document, and I'm using this as an opportunity to tell you to all buy the book and read it, because I don't think you'll understand Augsburg College uh, until you have read it. But I'm happy to present these copies uh, to these two gentlemen as a, an indication of our appreciation. General Schroeder, Mr. Nelson. Now I'd like to call uh, on one of our distinguished guests for this week, the official representative of uh, the Kingdom of Norway and of the Church of Norway, uh, Bishop Kara Stoylen, the Bishop of Kristiansand, and I'm going to ask him to make a presentation at this time. We're very happy that Bishop Stoylen is here uh, for these events. He will be preaching at our ecumenical service one week from today. Bishop Stoylen. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not staying here presenting a gift on ten or twenty-five thousand dollars, but I have uh, I have brought a, a, a gift which may be precious in quite another way. I thought of this Augsburg room, and um, I was reminded on uh, my days in the childhood when I was reading from and my brother Sig, who is present here, was reading from, from Luther's postilla, we call it, sermon books for my grandmother. And George Sverdrup, the first one, looking down upon us from the wall. <clears throat> and then I thought I should bring to the Augsburg room, just as a little talk of gratitude and admiration for this college, this old book from 1834, which was used in my, child, in, in my home as a child. I have um, no great ideas of uh, this book being read by the students uh, at Augsburg. <laughs> Um, I, it, is, it is told that my brother Sig um, uh, used to try to get from page 420 to 422 in, in one uh, lading like this, you know, to make it a little shorter. But when he continued reading, Grandmother Heiberg uh, used to stop him and said, Why oh, is I missing something? She said, I'm missing something. She, she knew his Luther, you know. But I thought perhaps in the library, this old book with sermons from Luther may be a sign of the continuity of times and uh, what is behind this whole college. So I, in this way, presented to you, President Anderson, as a token of uh, gratitude and admiration and all wishes of good luck for Augsburg in the years to come. I uh, thank you.
Thank you, Bishop Stoyland. One does not part with such a volume easily because it means a great deal, I know, to the families from which you have come. But we deeply appreciate your willingness to share this volume with us, and it will become a prized possession as a part of our City of Augsburg room. Thank you very much, and please express our deep appreciation to others in your family for this book. Is uh, Mr. Ramberg here? Did I see you, Leonard, here? I was hoping to call on him at this time for a response from the Board of Regents, but I take it that something has prevented him from being here. I want to just call your attention to the rest of the events of which this is the first in our centennial week. And we hope that by just about this time, one week from today, we will have had a great experience together, climaxed by the concert which will be given in Northrop Auditorium with the world premiere of a specially commissioned work done for the Minnesota Orchestra and for the Augsburg Choir. And I'm going to put in a commercial here again. I hope that those who know us and love us will support us also in this venture to show the wedding between the creative uh, genius which exists among our friends uh, of, at Augsburg and uh, the uh, cultural resources and forces uh, of this community. So please uh, support us also in this. Thank you then for coming. We want you to uh, go into the Augsburg room and browse around and see the things that are there. We want you to join us for some refreshments downstairs in the Alumni Lounge and in the Marshall Room, and we hope that you will spend time uh, enjoying one another and the refreshments which have been prepared. Are there any other announcements which uh, have not been called to my attention that ought to be made at this time? Aha! The commercial from the other end now, and that ought to make it complete. I'm sure that also the very interesting commemorative plate uh, is uh, available there. Will you stand then and sing the hymn as indicated on your program? And with that, this session will be dismissed. thanks to all that took part in this program and to you for coming. May the peace of the Lord be with you. You are dismissed.